The reading today is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived amongst, among them at one time, gratifying the, the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. It's not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not by works, so no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of the Lord. Be and before we come to God's word, let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, um, there are numerous places we could go to gain an understanding of ourselves, to um, inform our opinion. Yet, Lord, we come before you now wanting your opinion to reign supreme. And so, Lord, we ask that you would help us to humbly accept uh, the word that we are to sit under now. Amen. I wonder if uh, when you looked at the sermon topic this morning, you wondered what exactly is it that we're meant to be overcoming in our overcoming series? Overcoming self-esteem. Well, is that high self-esteem or is that low self-esteem? Do we have to choose? Well, actually, I want us this morning to arrive at the point where we overcome the yo-yo of self-esteem altogether. I don't know about you, but I want to get off of the self-esteem train. I've had enough. I'm tired of bouncing between uh, having an overinflated opinion of myself and then a completely deflated one. And if you're anything like me, then that can happen several times in the same day, can't it? And it's exhausting. Now, it won't surprise you to know that we have associated with self-esteem many issues that are rife in our society today and indeed in the church. Our opinion of ourselves can consume us and this doesn't just affect our feelings. It has real, tangible effects on our lives. So let me ask you this morning, what is your opinion of yourself? Have you got a high opinion of yourself? Do you hold yourself in high regard? Well, if that's the case, research suggests that generally you will be more positive, more confident in overcoming challenges. You'll be able to weather and deal with um, criticism and knocks more effectively? Have you a low opinion of yourself? Then maybe you might be more prone to negativity and that may extend towards others as well as yourself and negative comments will actually knock you. You may languish in the face of challenge. Now the world sees this as the big problem. It's low self-esteem they want to target. And truly, it is a terrible thing when someone is bereft of all confidence. 
You see it in sport all the time, don't you? Uh, these amazing athletes, they do it all the time on the training ground, and then something happens, and they just seem to lose it, and they collapse. It's awful watching, isn't it? Someone, when you know they can do something, yet they just fail every time because they have no confidence anymore. And so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that they've lost it. They can't do whatever it is they're meant to do anymore. But what the world doesn't acknowledge is that equally, there is something terribly sad about high self-esteem. There's something terribly sad when someone is full of confidence in something that they're not able to do. Now, if you want me to prove it to you, just think back to the example of all those cringeworthy X Factor and Britain's Got Talent auditions. They're awful, aren't they? Now, I don't know who these people's friends and family are, but they must be pumping them full of confidence to get them in front of the telly, to get them in front of that big crowd. But they're setting them up to fail. And we laugh, we have a good laugh at them, don't we? But the cringe makes you shudder, it's cruel. But what is actually going on with us? Why do we do this bouncing yo-yo? Why have we got these problems? Well, I want to suggest that our self-esteem is like a balloon. It inflates every time that we get uh, positivity, and it deflates every time we're met with negativity. So you get a, a few likes on your social media post, starts pumping away. And you get an email from your boss recognizing your hard work and effort, pumps it up a bit more. You get a text from that person you like. You come home to find your spouse has done all the housework, has put the kids to bed, and just um, is made it so that you can have a nice, relaxing evening. And at that point, our self-esteem balloon looks really full. Things are going really well. And then, uh-oh, you get negative feedback on your latest project. That person you like has seen your text and not replied. You find out your spouse has gone out with her friends and left you with all the washing up. And what happens? And it's gone. Now, how can we overcome this? How can we get out of the habit of merely pumping up our egos as a way of keeping ourselves going? How can we make sure we don't have so high opinion of ourselves that we're just waiting to burst, but also avoid being constantly in a state of deflation? Well, we don't need a higher view of ourselves, but we need a right view of ourselves. And this is what Scripture brings. All of Scripture is a mirror detailing reality giving us true perspective. But let's turn, if you haven't already, to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. For this is one of the clearest pictures of who we are and what we're really like. Now, there's simply three points that I want to draw out of this passage related to self-esteem. See, if you have self-esteem issues, and we all do, then this is what this passage will highlight to you. Firstly, uh, we're far, far worse than we think. Secondly, we are more loved than we deserve. And thirdly, we in Christ are elevated beyond anything we can imagine. So let's look at that first point. We are far worse than we think. Now, I'm sure if, if you're struggling with low self-esteem at the minute, uh, this sounds like a pretty harsh, a pretty cruel response. But remember, uh, we're not coming here, we're not coming to God's word to pump each other up full of false positivity. No, rather, we don't need that high view of ourselves, we need that right view of ourselves. And as Christians, whatever we think goes into and contributes to our self-esteem... Surely the first thing that we need to consider is that small matter of being sinful. 
See, low self-esteem could be caused by a range of different things. Uh, you could have problems at work. Uh, maybe you're under great stress or in a difficult relationship. Maybe you're experiencing prejudice. And maybe you have material concerns that are getting you down, making you feel low. Now, all those are serious concerns, but they aren't our ultimate concern. Our ultimate concern should be, what is our spiritual condition before God? What is his opinion of us as opposed to all the other things we judge ourselves against? Do you think you're worthless or pathetic or a failure or do you think you're ugly? Well, judge yourself against the ultimate standard and then find out. And so then we come to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And this couldn't be any starker comment on what we are really like. Outside of Christ, we are dead in our transgressions, dead in our sins. We're dead, no pulse, no hope. And this is worse than most pictures that we paint of ourselves, isn't it? We might well admit that humanity is not perfect. Uh, maybe that humanity is broken and fractured. Uh, we might well say that we are covered in flaws and blemishes, but the Bible paints the darkest picture of our moral status before God. We are dead. Now, if that doesn't pop your self-esteem balloon, I don't know what will. The thing is, our opinion of ourselves is rarely as hopeless as being dead. And we tend to hold on to some semblance of life because otherwise that would be truly hopeless, wouldn't it? Low self-esteem makes us feel that we are unable to do anything about our situation. But when we're looking at our spiritual condition, well, actually, that's, that's absolutely accurate. That's bang on. See, we can't do anything about our spiritual condition. If we think about ourselves as spiritually ill, well, then we might just recover. Now, if we think of ourselves as spiritually broken, uh, then there's the possibility we might put ourselves back together again. If we think of ourselves as not perfect, but essentially good, well, then we can work out our flaws and clean up our acts. But being spiritually dead, well, there's nothing you can do for the dead person. They're gone. Now, is there anything more humbling than recognizing our spiritual state is broken beyond repair, except for some miracle of divine intervention? Now, this puts into perspective our material concerns, doesn't it? Because we look at some unbelievers and they look very much alive. We look and judge ourselves against the physical body of the athlete or of the model, uh, the competent mind of the scholar, the vibrant personality of the celebrity. And so often, these are the things we long for to give us that self-esteem boost, to pump more air into our ego balloon. But the Bible's verdict on all such people outside of Christ, and that's the definitive opinion that matters, is that they're spiritually dead. This is the first point we must come to if we're to have a right perspective of ourselves. Without Christ, we are far worse than we care to admit. So I guess now everyone's self-esteem bloom is completely flat. Have we, have we managed to get all the air out? That's good. The biblical verdict has put a hole in it. And that's absolutely fine. Good. We don't need it anymore. Because instead of pumping air into our fragile egos, we're going to find something that is truly worthy of our esteem. And that is God. Well, how does that help us uh, under, uh, understand ourselves rightly? Well, that is because it is this God that loves us more than we deserve. See, when we arrive at verses 4 and 5, we see that there is hope for our uh, situation, but it is not in ourselves. 
God, in his great love for us, rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ when we became Christians. And so you are more loved than you deserve. Now, it is common for us to feel better about ourselves when we realize that we are loved. When we get that text of the person we like, when we receive that warm embrace, when we get that loving compliment, well, what is it about those things that makes us feel better, that inflates our self-esteem? Well, usually it's because it reflects well on us, doesn't it? That person loves me because there must be something lovely about me. Yet we can't say that about God's love. His love is not based on our performance. It is by grace that we have been saved. Now you may say, well, how does this love help us with our self-esteem? Well, it doesn't. It doesn't at all. And that's okay because it prompts us to forget self-esteem altogether. Now, surely this is better by far, to just be rid of self-esteem altogether. So instead of looking for things to pump up your ego, to get more air in, wouldn't it be great just to enjoy things for what they are? This is what we have to do with God's love for us. Because it's not conditional, God's love doesn't reflect well on us. It doesn't boost our self-esteem. It doesn't vindicate us. It doesn't affirm our life choices or add to our resume. But it is wondrously beautiful in and of itself, isn't it? See, when we consider that we are loved by God, knowing that we were dead in our sins, by nature deserving of his wrath, doesn't that just make you appreciate how wonderful God is? not us. See, God's love for us should cause us to lift our eyes from ourselves and to focus on God. So instead of looking for what God affirms in you, just focus your attention on the beauty and the love of God in Christ and appreciate that for what it is. Now, just think for a moment how this transformed perspective might impact in other areas. Imagine you look to other things just for what they are instead of what they contribute to your self-esteem. Wouldn't you love to look at your reflection and when you catch sight of it, not cringe. We don't want to cringe when we see ourselves. But neither we don't want to fall in love with ourselves and be infatuated. Just accept what you look like for what it is. Wouldn't you love it that when you receive criticism, not to be devastated by it, paralyzed and unable to do anything, but equally not to blindly ignore it, but just accept it for what it is. Wouldn't it be great if you weren't constantly daydreaming about success or beating yourself up over past failures, but just accepting where you're at for what it is? See, this perspective completely rids us from the yo-yo of self-esteem. The constant dramatic inflation and deflation of our egos. God's love for us, shown to us by grace, encourages encourages us to do exactly that. See, knowing that we were unlovable, and yet knowing that God still loves us lavishly, it diverts our attention, doesn't it? God's love doesn't say anything about us because it's not based on us, so we can simply accept it for what it is. And when we do that, how can we be consumed with our self-image when our gaze is fixed on something as beautiful as God's love? Now, finally, let's look at the result of God's love for us in Christ. Because The amazing thing is, though God's love does nothing for our self-esteem, it does bestow on us the highest of privileges and honour. Now, why doesn't this puff up our self-esteem? Why isn't this just more air? Well, because we've done nothing to earn it. It's a humble dignity that we simply enjoy if we are in Christ. So let's look at the details of that by reading from verse 6. 
God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. It's incredible the honour and privilege that we enjoy as believers. See, as if it wasn't enough to experience God's merciful love, he now graciously raises us up with Christ. Once we were dead, hopeless, unable to please God, yet now we are raised up, we are made alive. Yet we're not simply raised, we are elevated to the highest of places, seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. Now we can look forward to being elevated beyond anything this world can offer. Higher than the most powerful positions of the world, higher than the greatest height of someone's fame or someone's greatest achievement, or maybe it's riches that you're after. In the coming ages, the riches a Christian can anticipate are incomparable, it says. This is what we have to look forward to in Christ. And we can take absolute pleasure in this reality. But remember this, this is who we are in Christ. Apart from Christ, dead. But in Christ, elevated beyond anything this world can offer. Now, isn't that a good reason as anyway, as any, to just get rid of the self-esteem balloon? Why would you constantly go back trying to pump up your ego with the things that this world has to offer when, if in Christ, you are full already? Well, of course you wouldn't. But we need to remind ourselves of this reality. We need it at the forefront of our minds. And this is how we can help one another. Often, with good intention, uh, we see a fellow believer who's downcast and we rightly want to get alongside them, support them, build them up. But what do you say to them? Well, often what we do is we try and pump up their self-esteem balloon. We say, oh, don't worry. We've all sinned, mate. Oh, I don't know about uh, what they're on about, but I think you look lovely. Chin up, I believe you can turn everything around. Now, I'm not suggesting it's wrong to pay people compliments or to encourage people truthfully. But if you really want to pick up a fellow believer, don't just pump up their self-esteem because self-esteem is fragile and far quicker to deflate than it is to pump up. Instead, point them to the truths of who they are in Christ. Give them eternal perspective. Not only are these things greater, but they are totally secure. See, unlike our fragile egos that can be popped by anything sharp and cutting, uh, nothing can dethrone Christ from his elevated position. Therefore, if we are in Christ, our future with him is totally secure. If we don't constantly pump up our self-esteem, well, it will soon deflate, won't it? Whenever we fail or hurt by others, it's going to go down. And in fact, it's hard to keep up sometimes, isn't it? But our dignity in Christ is not based on our performance. It's based on his. So we can't muck this up. Let's do away with our self-esteem. Let's finally just let go of that balloon. Let it fly away. It's no good to you. Don't keep pumping away at it because all that does is keep you fluctuating in your mood and your enjoyment of the Christian life. Instead, dwell on these core truths that we've learnt from this passage. And that will cause you to live a stable, solid life. And did you notice that the immediate impact of these truths on the believer in verse 10? 
recognizing we are God's handiwork, instead of looking inwards, we practically serve others. We are released to do good works prepared by God in advance for us to do. Outside of Christ, we were worse than we thought, yet we are more loved than we deserve. And so in Christ, we can look forward to being elevated beyond anything this world can offer. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we pray that your word would ruin uh, reign supreme in our lives, that that would be the main thing that we look to for our opinion of ourselves. We recognize that outside of you, we have nothing to contribute, nothing to, offer, nothing to feel good about. But in you, we have the richest expectations to arrive at. And Lord, we pray that that would be the thing that we dwell on in the weeks to come your performance, your greatness, your goodness, and that that would be the joy we need to continue living a stable Christian life full of hope. Amen.